I'd like to thank uh, Carlo and everyone for inviting me here. It's a great pleasure to be here at, uh, um, uh, at this great university. Uh, I haven't been to Michigan before, so it's a great opportunity to see a little bit of Michigan while I'm here uh, and see the university. So thank you for inviting me. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, quantum biology. Um, that's the title of the book, as Carlo uh, showed, Life on the Edge. And um, and why, have I, why am I interested in, in quantum biology? What uh, is my motivation? I'm a biologist. And as a biologist, uh, always the biggest question to me, the one that really got me interested in biology, looking into, say, a rock pool on, on, the, on the beach, and you see things like, look like rocks, like a sea urchin looks a bit like a rock. You touch it, boom, and it responds. And that, what is so different between living stuff, as you can see here, um, and the dead stuff? And I was brought up as a biochemist. Um, as I, go, I grew up as you know, from a tiny boy, I a biochemist. But no, I went to university and then learned biochemistry. And we were told that the difference is really all to do with entropy and thermodynamics and stuff like that. I never was entirely convinced. It didn't seem convincing enough that the science that it was all down to the same kind of science that drives steam trains up hillsides. So I was looking elsewhere, and one of the places uh, I became interested in more than a, a couple of decades ago is whether it can be to do with quantum mechanics. And uh, I only learned about quantum mechanics just over about uh, 20 years ago. Um, I, I would guess Probably my training as a um, biochemist is probably similar to how biochemists and biologists are trained here. You don't learn about quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is something kind of exotic at the, um, you know, for extreme scientists who do um, mathematics and really hard equations. So that's biologists can't really understand at all. But I read a really nice book about quantum mechanics called Schrodinger's Cat by John Gribbin. And it's made, it gave me an understanding a little bit of an understanding. So, to um, well, bring my electronics pointer, so I can use this big old stick. So basically, what I'm going to do for I'm assuming that there's quite a few people in the audience who, like me, 20 years ago, don't have a clue about quantum mechanics. So I'm going to give those a little quick introduction to quantum mechanics. So first of all, there's two, two worlds that we can kind of look at, two ways of looking at the world, and one that's familiar, and the one that I was taught as a biochemist is classical chemistry, <laughs> classical science, in which objects have discrete points in space where they inhabit, like planets, like apples falling on heads, and, um, and that beneath it all is thermodynamics, the random motion of molecules, atoms and molecules, and that's what drives steam trains up hills, and what drives biology. That's what I was told as a, bio, as a biochemist. And we have these ball-on-stick molecules that work pretty darn well. But then the quantum world is very different. Particles don't have um, <coughs> discrete positions in space. They can do weird things like traveling, um, like being in two or two million places at once and being connected in all sorts of weird ways. Now, what I'm going to do to describe what's strange about quantum mechanics is describe the experiment that the <coughs> quantum physicist Richard Feynman said, all of quantum mechanics is in this experiment. It's a two-slit experiment. It's illustrated here. But I'm going to go into it in a little bit more detail to illustrate how quantum mechanics works and why it's so strange. <coughs> Okay, um, so these are the things that, that we're going to look at with particle duality and the double slit experiment because all of quantum mechanics is really about wave particle duality. So here's light. Light we know is a wave. And if you shine it between, uh, allow light, really to get this, it's got to be not a light bulb, it's got to be a laser, it's got to be light of a uh, single frequency. But if you shine that through a screen which has two slits, then the waves going through the screen will emerge either being coherent in which the waves, the peaks and troughs of the waves will be in step and then they will reinforce each other to give you um, positive, re um, 
uh, reinforcement, so you get a bright band on the screen, or if a peak of a wave means meets the trough of another wave, they cancel each other out. So you get destructive interference, dark bands on the screen. So constructive and destructive interference are a sign of <coughs> wave mechanics, not necessarily quantum mechanical, just wave mechanics. But it shows that light is wave mechanical, and this is what Thomas Young showed several hundred years ago. Light is wave mechanical because it shows these constructive and destructive interference effects. Something like sand isn't. If you pass sand through two slits, you'll get two piles of sand. It doesn't show interference effects. So the difference between particles and waves can be demonstrated by seeing how they behave in the two-slit experiment. So single waves, as we've looked at already, go through both slits at once, and they interfere with each other. Then the uh, waves coming from the different slits interfere with each other to generate a um, pattern, the interference pattern. Now that's familiar, it's wave mechanics. You can see it by dropping some pebbles into a pond. And you'll see the waves, and you'll see how they interfere with each other. Particles don't do that. Okay? Now we start doing an experiment on a screen. Uh, and we fire electrons through the double slit experiment. And um, first of all, we'll close one of the slits. Okay. So now we're firing electrons from some electron gun. It goes through a, uh, this green. There's only one slit open, so it leaves a track on the, on the uh, screen, which is some kind of scintillation counter. It's going to count, detect the electrons landing on the screen. Now they look like a pile of sand. They've only got one place to go. It looks like a pile of sand. And we know, we kind of, think, as, as biologists at least, we think of electrons as little particles. So this makes sense. Electrons are little particles. They're going through. And they form this pile of sand kind of um, pattern. But what happens when we open up the other slit and give the electrons two possible paths? We get an interference effect. So despite the fact that when we fire electrons from a gun that we think of as being a particle gun and it forms the pile of sand kind of pattern on the screen, they're still interfering with each other. So it's got a wave mechanical property as well, electrons. But then we can kind of say, well, water has wave mechanical properties. And we think of water as being particulate in the sense that it's made up of water molecules. But actually, what gives you the wave mechanical properties are the motion of billions, trillions of particles moving together. And it's actually that that's wave mechanical, not the individual water molecules. So maybe the same is true for these electrons. And we can investigate that. So that's the question. Maybe the wave pattern is generated by a collective pattern of electrons. <laughs> but maybe the wave pattern is generated by the collective behavior of electrons. But if we fire them one at a time, we will eliminate that collective behavior. So now we have this gun that fires single electrons, bullets of electrons, one at a time. And we get them landing on the screen, one at a time, like a bullet hole on the screen. And it looks like a particle when it's leaving the electron gun. It appears like a particle when it's hitting the screen. It must be a particle. But then we send more electrons through the system. And more. And you get an interference pattern. So how is it that we send electrons by the gun, firing one particle at a time, they leave the system as a particle, they appear at the screen as a particle, but in between, they seem to be behaving like a wave, because you get interference patterns. Yeah, that can't be right. What's going on? So a single electron can't possibly be in two places at once. Here we're firing one electron at a time, so it can't be collective behavior of electrons. One of them at a time. 
How can a single electron be in two places at once? A wave can be in two places at once, but not a particle. So you get that puzzle. And then you can kind of say, well, it can't be in two places at once. It's got to be in one of these slits, or the other one. So you say, well, let's put an electron detector at the slit. We'll find out where it is. So we put an electron detector at the slit, and it beeps, beep, as soon as an electron goes through, say, the top slit. So we can detect where it's gone. And if it doesn't go through the top slit, and we get find a signal on the screen, it must have gone through the bottom slit. So now we've lost the interference pattern. <coughs> now when we've tried to detect the electron and where it's gone, the interference pattern has disappeared. It's now gone back to being like a particle of sand. But then, so the electron seems to have a definite position in space again. But what happens when we switch the detector off now? We get the interference pattern back. So how is it that when we have the detector on, it behaves like a particle, and when we switch it off, it behaves like a wave? Even though it seems to be leaving the gun and arriving at the detector as a particle. So, this seems very strange. It seems to be that the electron is leaving the, gu the electron gun as a particle, then becomes some kind of wave that can travel through two places at once to go through the screen and somehow interfere with itself to arrive at the screen at a particular point, but it's actually gone through two places at once as a wave in order to get there. And this is the heart of quantum mechanics, that particles, like electrons, like protons, like even atoms and even molecules, <laughs> fullerene C60 has been fired through the two-slit experiment, and it goes through two places at once. So this was the fundamental kind of rethink for me in terms of talking about biology. Biology deals with particles. We imagine particles like protons, electrons, being transported from one place to another as particles. But quantum mechanics is telling us that there's something different, that they behave as waves. So, and then there's the measurement thing. So when we try to measure where this particle is, that looks like it's behaving like a wave, then it says, no, I'm a particle. So how does that interact? And this is a, another hugely important part of quantum mechanics. When we interact with the system, we disturb it in some way, and we remove the wave mechanical property and turn it into a particle again. And this is hugely important in quantum mechanics, and mainly important in living systems as well, how living systems measure themselves. And this is what we call quantum measurement. So these are some, uh, these are the kind of conclusions. Particles behave as waves when we're not watching them. In this state, there can be in two or more. There can be, you can do this experiment with a hundred slits and the wave will go through all of them. Um, measurement forces the wave to choose one route and thereby become a localized particle. And that's really, that's your, for those of you who don't know quantum mechanics, that's your introduction to quantum mechanics. Everything is different at this particle kind of level. So quantum weirdness we could call, sometimes it's called. It's not really weird, really, the world we see is weird. What is actually happening at a molecular level, at a particle level, is quantum mechanics. The puzzle is why everything behaves different at this level. But there's no question that at a level of particles, quantum mechanics rules. And these strange things happen. Particles can be two places at once, or two states at once. Tunneling can also happen. Particles can travel like ghosts through a wall that they shouldn't be able to get through. And then one of the weirdest of all, entanglement. Particles that are separated in space can nevertheless, nevertheless behave as if they're not. And this is so strange that Einstein, who remember gave us black holes and warped space-time, he said, no way, this can't happen. He called it spooky action at a distance and didn't believe it. It was one of the reasons he never really came to terms with quantum mechanics in his lifetime, despite the fact he helped to found the science. 
And part of it was because of this entanglement, that if you separate particles, even by galactic distances, quantum mechanics will still say they behave as if they're not separated. And experiments have been done that demonstrate that. What Einstein called spooky action at a distance, which seemed to interfere, doesn't quite, but seemed to interfere with general relativity's um, um, ban of, uh, of information traveling faster than light. So that's what is happening at the level of particles inside living systems, as is inside this table. The question is, does it make any more difference to the behavior of living systems than it does to this table? And this is what quantum biology is all about. Because up until recently, it was thought that quantum, that quantum effects are not important in biology. And that is because they're very delicate. These experiments that you that I described the double slit experiment, have it be done in a vacuum and you've got to have laser light or, or coherent systems and it's very easily lost. You very easily lose the quantum mechanical aspects of systems. So experiments, physicists here will be cooling systems down to very close to absolute zero, performing experiments on um, on the, uh, tables where vibrations are all uh, removed and in vacuums in order to maintain quantum effects. And that's because they're lost very easily by the molecular noise that is all around us. So they require a very delicate balance to maintain this quantum coherence that gives you these weird effects like coherence, tunneling, and entanglement. And to put it another way, you can detect wave mechanical effects in a still pond. But imagine dropping pebbles into the torrent on your right. You won't see wave mechanical effects there very easily because there's too much churning, on, churning of random molecular events going on. And life was thought to be much more like that on the right than what's going on on the left. So it was thought unlikely that quantum mechanics is involved. And particularly as we know more about how cells behave. This is an animation of, the cell, of a cell membrane. And this is what's going on. It's more like that torrent. There's so much motion, you wouldn't expect, this is at, at room temperature, the, the simulation. There's so much random molecular motion that you would expect that it would destroy the quantum mechanical effects. So that's why it's generally being ignored, and that's why biochemists like me weren't taught quantum mechanics. Oops, that's a bit wrong. Yeah. Okay, but not everyone believed that. Erwin Schrodinger, one of the founders of um, um, quantum mechanics, of course, uh, wrote this book, What is Life, in 1944, in which he made a claim that life really depends on quantum mechanics. A gene, he was very interested in heredity and the peculiarities of heredity, and I won't go into the details of it, but he claimed that a gene, or perhaps the whole chromosome, is an aperiodic crystal in which every atom and every group of atoms play an individual role, which has to be a masterpiece of highly differentiated order, safeguarded by the conjuring rod of quantum theory. So it was basically going down to the quantum level to explain the order of life. And that was really, he was kind of saying that if everything is, is rather like this, which we know it is, how does life manage to maintain its order, its orderly system? So what Trona claimed is it does so through quantum mechanics, reaching down to that level of order that's in quantum mechanical systems. So he published this book in 1944. It was very influential. But about a decade later, Watson and Crick unveiled the double helix. And really, molecular biology then kind of took over. And molecular biologists didn't bother to learn quantum mechanics, and they got on very well. But yet, actually, if you look at the double helix and Watson and Crick's structure, it is interesting to note that it corresponds exactly to what Schrodinger said, in which every atom and every group of atoms play an individual role. This is a base pair for the non-biologists, well, you probably know this anyway, a base pair, a, a, a letter of the genetic code. What is making this 
The information of this is encoded really in the position of these protons. Individual protons are encoding genetic information. So it's exactly what Schrodinger predicted, that every atom and groups of atoms play an individual role in genetic information. So that was right. And the other thing to bear in mind is this life is, is molecular engineering. This is how an enzyme is working. It's a simulation of an enzyme uh, dihydrofolate reductase. And you can see what it's doing. It's taking a molecule and manipulating it. It's pulling particles, electrons, protons, etc., around in this molecule. It's bumping into quantum mechanics. It's got to be bumping into quantum mechanics because that's what's holding the molecule together. So if you're manipulating a molecule, moving stuff around in the molecule, it's using quantum mechanics. And, you know, enzymes do all of the important things in life. This, oh, I will forget about the noise here. I, didn't, I meant to turn the sound off. But this is just showing DNA replication. And this is being performed by lots of different enzymes having a role to replicate every single cell of your body. No, I won't go on. So it is a remarkable thing that's going on, and it's all going on by the manipulation of individual particles within molecules that's making life, really. So, I think Schrodinger was right, but by and large, molecular biology um, ignored it, actually. This is one more slide before I can get to that point. Um, and then the other important point is that life has this unique ability to amplify quantum events to the macroscopic level. For example, the color of your eyes is determined by a single molecule that was inherited from your mother or your father. There's nothing in the inanimate world that has that sensitivity that a single molecule will determine the characteristics at a macroscopic level. And that's because the amplification of life, it allows individual molecular events by enzymes and the way that, um, uh, that uh, molecular systems are amplified in all sorts of metabolic ways and enzymatic ways and genetic ways. So single Molecular events have macroscopic consequences. As well as determining the color of your eyes, it can determine life and death for genetic disease. So, despite all that, molecular biology went on pretty regardless of quantum mechanics. And it was very successful, of course. One of the, with quantum mechanics, the most successful science of the 20th century, really. And yet, so mostly, Quantum mechanics was forgotten about, despite Erwin Schrodinger's claims, until the late 20th century. And then quantum mechanics started to turn up in a number of systems. Photosystems, enzymes, magnetoreception, smell, DNA mutations, origin of life, possibly even consciousness. And what I'm going to go through now is some of these examples of where quantum mechanics has reared its head. And probably one of the best established is in photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is, of course, the most important biochemical reaction, or most important chemical reaction, on our planet, because it makes all the biomass. It's a remarkable reaction in which air, water, and light is turned into plants. It's the most remarkable thing. Nothing in the universe is anything like that. Air, water, light, turn it into a plant. That's what photosynthesis does. And it does it to make all of the biomass, pretty much all of the biomass on our planet, because, you know, carnivores eat the plant, no, herbivores eat the plants, carnivores eat the herbivores. So all of our mass has been made in, bias, in photosynthesis. <coughs> there are many steps to photosynthesis, many, many steps, and they all have different efficiencies. But one of the first steps in photosynthesis is when a photon of light is captured and its energy is turned into an exciton, which is a vibrating electron. And this happens within a photosystem of, um, plant, um, uh, of plants and microbes. And essentially what's happening oh, my, uh, stick, is the photon is captured in one point in space, and then it has to be transported to another point. And it's those, um, sorry, not the photon, the exciton. So the exciton, and it's the photon energy is converted to an exciton, and then the exciton has to transfer 
across from one photosystem to another to another until it reaches reaction symptom. The efficiency of that transport under optimal conditions is close to 100%, as close as you can measure. And that doesn't really make sense classically because excitons are unstable and they should mostly lose their energy before they reach the reaction center, and yet they don't. So it's been a bit of a puzzle understanding how this step in photosynthesis is so efficient. Experiments done in, um, uh, by Greg Engel <coughs> By Greg Engel, in, when he was working in Graham Fleming's lab, lab in California, uh, investigated this by looking at isolated photosystems, uh, pulsing them with uh, uh, laser light, femtosecond laser light, and then essentially looking at the energy that is reflected from these systems. And what was demonstrated is that the energy travels to the reaction center as a wave. So it's as if, so actually, um, I'll, I'll point this out first. So this, as I said, this looks like a very neat system. It doesn't have much trouble finding its way to the reaction center. There are only a few ways to go. This is what reaction centers really look like. Each of those circles is, a, uh, is the photosystem within a reaction center. So actually, it's a whole forest of molecules that this exciton has to navigate through before it finds its way to the reaction center, and yet it does so with 100% efficiency under optimal conditions. This is Greg Engel's experiment in which he was looking at the light being reflected from these systems, and what he found was is the light came out in waves, suggesting that actually, uh, and he called these waves quantum beats, because it suggested that the system was remaining coherent, that the exciton was transported through the system as a wave. And these waves, this quantum coherent beating, lasted for hundreds of femtoseconds, far longer than would be expected for a system that is operating at room temperature in a uh, plant or microbe. He got this coherent quantum beats for hundreds of femtoseconds. So he proposed that the, that the exciton travels through the system rather like we looked at the electron traveling through the double slit experiment as a wave. So it's using the wave mechanical property of investigating all the possible routes through the photosystem and somehow selecting the one that is most efficient. So it's a solution to essentially the traveling salesman problem. Traveling salesman problem is how do you get from one place to another by the optimal route? This seems to be solving the tra traveling salesman problem by going through all routes simultaneously. So that's photos uh, photosynthesis as a um, uh, where quantum biology is in photosynthesis. Now, there's been a lot of experiments since uh, 2007 when Greg Engel first demonstrated this. Many other labs have also worked on these systems and shown that they get similar quantum beats. Uh, the experiments that Greg did originally were at uh, um, cryogenic temperatures. It's, they've since been repeated at room temperature and they've been demonstrated in not only in microbes but in plant systems. So this seems to be happening at room temperature, in trees, in grass, all around us, and seems to be at least partly responsible for some of the efficiency of photosynthesis that generates the biomass in our planet. So that's an important and very dynamic area of quantum biology. Now another is enzymes. I've already discussed enzymes briefly and how they work. They're catalysts, of course, but they're very efficient catalysts. They have factors of of catalytic, catalytic efficiency, how much they accelerate a chemical reaction by up to about 10 to the 20 or so. And to give you a feeling for that number, I know probably you don't need this, but 10 to the 20, if we accelerate our walking rate by 10 to the 20, we could walk across galaxies in milliseconds. That's the kind of acceleration that's delivered by enzymes. And it's always been a bit of a puzzle how they do it. There are lots of different mechanisms involved, but if you add up all those classical mechanisms, you don't get 10 to the 20. So there's a gap in our understanding of how well enzymes work. 
And then in the 19, actually back in the 1980s or so, it was demonstrated that electrons seem to travel between enzymes by electron tunneling. And then more surprisingly, recent experiments have shown that protons in enzyme reactions are able to travel um, in enzyme reactions by proton by tunneling. So just to give you a little bit more detail on proteins, it's not very clear here. Actually, I'll make it clearer by doing that, hopefully. Um, so tunneling is when a particle can pass through a barrier which it wouldn't do classically because there's too much of an energy barrier. But because of the wave mechanical properties of particles, that there are actually waves, the wave can travel can pass through the barrier, even though energetically it shouldn't. And this is illustrated, it's not really clear in this slide, but that particle is, that white blob is the particle, and some of it is actually getting through this barrier, rather like it goes through a, going through a wall. So enzymes seem to be using that to account for their efficiency, both in electrons uh, but with electron tunneling and also with proton tunneling. And this is shown for... Um, so the electron tunneling was shown by default and, and chance in the 1970s. Tunneling of, uh, of electrons uh, between enzymes by tens of angstroms. And then more recently, proton tunneling has been demonstrated in a number of labs. And how they demonstrate that in enzyme reactions is... Uh, a quite simple trick of replacing hydrogen with deuterium in the enzyme reaction. And if tunneling is involved in an enzyme reaction, then changing the mass of the proton as the nucleus of hydrogen to the mass of the deuteron, the nucleus of deuterium, doubles its mass. Proton, of course, the nucleus of hydrogen is just a proton. Nucleus of deuterium is a proton and a neutron, so it has double the mass, two rather than one. And because mass is in the exponential of the tunneling equation, that really drops the tunneling rate. And the question then is, does it affect enzyme reaction rates? And it does. So for this um, enzyme, for instance, aromatic amine dehydrogenase, which transfers um, a hydride ion uh, here, in uh, the enzyme reaction, and essentially, uh, come back to this, what tunneling is all about, the energy of the system isn't sufficient to go over the barrier, and what it seems to be able to do is go through the barrier by tunneling. And this is demonstrated by replacing hydrogen with deuterium, and that reduces the efficiency of that reaction, so you get what's called a kinetic isotope effect. A kinetic isotope effect is the ratio of the efficiency of the reaction in ordinary water with hydrogen to the rate to the efficiency of the reaction when hydrogen has been replaced with deuterium. If they're the same, you've got no kinetic isotope effect. If they're different, you have a kinetic isotope effect, which may be caused by tunneling. That isn't all of the evidence. You have to look at other things like temperature. But with those, um, uh, uh, once that is done, you can clearly show tunneling of protons in enzyme reactions. So in en enzyme reactions, you have tunneling of both protons and electrons. And what seems to be happening in enzymes is they're bringing the components of a, of a tunneling event close enough, because tunneling is also extremely sensitive to distance, and normally tunneling wouldn't occur between intramolecular um, molecules when you know one molecule or another molecule, but within an enzyme active site, the molecules are brought close enough together that it allows the tunneling reaction to take place. And that seems to be at least part of the efficiency of enzymes, that it, they manipulate the system to allow tunneling events to take place, which wouldn't happen if uh, in the enzyme uncatalyzed uh, reaction. So that's tunneling involved in enzymes. And enzymes, just to remind you, have made every single molecule in your body. So this is extremely important for all of biochemistry. And hydride proton transfer reactions account for about 20-30% of enzyme reactions. So 
they're extremely important. And electron transport, of course, is extremely important in electron transfer in enzymes is, is what's responsible for respiration. So it's also keeping us alive through electron tunneling. Now, the other, so we've had coherence in photosynthesis. We've had um, tunneling in enzyme reactions, now entanglement, spooky action at a distance, as, um, as Einstein called it. It's kind of the weirdest, and it's been, um, it's one of the most controversial because it's been implicated, I wouldn't say it's been proved yet, for bird navigation. And the experiments have been uh, done with robins, the European robin, which travels from Scandinavia down to um, southern Europe or North Africa to avoid the cold weather in Scandinavia over the winter. And these uh, ornithologists, Roswitha and um, uh, Wolfgang Wilschko, demonstrated in experiments in 1972 that birds, these birds have a compass. The idea that animals have a compass that can detect the Earth's magnetic field has always been controversial, but they clearly demonstrated <coughs> it in experiments in the 1970s. And then you have to ask the question, well, how does a compass work in a living animal? And they found rather odd features of this compass. You kind of think we can get um, a simple um, compass, a magnetic compass, which will point to north, like a Boy Scouts compass, I would call it, a guy's compass. Um, but their compass, the Robin's compass, required light. And that was strange. And they also demonstrated that it was an inclination compass. It finds the nearest pole, but can't distinguish between the poles. So an inclination compass detects the angle of inclination of the Earth's magnetic field against the surface of the Earth. And that angle is zero at the equator and 90 degrees at the pole. Anywhere in between, that inclination angle will point towards the pole. But in the northern hemisphere, it will point towards the north pole. In the southern hemisphere, it will point towards the south pole. And what the Walsh Coast demonstrated is that the robins have this light-dependent compass which always points to the nearest pole. So it seemed to be an inclination compass. So how do you, how do you make a compass out of a bird that will have these properties? Work by Klaus Schulten in the 1970s demonstrated that certain chemical reactions were magnetically sensitive, and the chemists amongst you will know about these. They involve free radicals, and I won't go into the details of it, but uh, one of his students, uh, Thurston Ritz, proposed that these kind of chemical reactions may be behind the bird's compass in this paper back in 2000, and they involve a protein called tryptochrome. I'll come into more details about that. Now, here's where my um, understanding of, uh, uh, of spin chemistry becomes a little bit dodgy. Um, but, and this is a slide borrowed from my colleague Alex Jones at the National Physics Laboratory. So, electrons, un electrons have spin. They have the quantum mechanical property of spin. So, they, they kind of spin and that generates a magnetic moment which will align in a magnetic field. If a, a molecule develop, generates, normally in, in um, atoms, electrons are paired. So they're paired, and that means that they, uh, that they don't have spin, because the, they're aligned so as they cancel each other out. But unpaired electrons will have spin, and they can be uh, sensitive to a magnetic field. So if you make a free radical which has unpaired electrons, then that will be sensitive, those free radicals will be sensitive to magnetic fields. And they are because, they do so because of this, where my understanding gets a little bit uh, dodgier, depends on whether the uh, different components of the free radical are aligned parallel or anti-parallel. And that becomes whether they're singlets or triplets. Singlets, if they're anti-parallel, can only be in one state. Triplets, if they're parallel, can have it be in three different states, okay? And they can then recombine to form uh, other um, products that can be either singlets or triplets. So the radical pair mechanism 
suggests that you have a molecule which has paired electrons, no magnetic sensitivity. Light comes and excites that molecule into making two free radicals. And they're quantum entangled. This is where the quantum mechanics comes in. In free radicals, the components of the, the two electrons remain entangled. And they can switch between the singular and the triplet state. And the singlet state doesn't decay back, but the triplet state can. They will decay by all sorts of different mechanisms. But at, in this state, they become sensitive to magnetic fields. And then the magnetic field will determine the products of the reaction. And that's given by that equation there, which I don't understand at all. But uh, that's basically the overall idea for how the bird's compass can detect a magnetic field. It's using these free radicals. And the free radicals are then generated in Thurston Ritz's um, theory in the enzyme cryptochrome, which is in the bird's eye. So the enzyme cryptochrome can generate free radicals. If those free, free radicals are quantum entanglement as they, entangled as they should be, then they will be sensitive to the Earth's magnetic field. <coughs> His theory predicted that the compass, if it was this kind of mechanism, should be disrupted by high-frequency radio waves. And in experiments performed with the Welsh Coast, he demonstrated that that was the case, that the Robin's compass was disrupted by high-frequency radio waves, So, which is consistent with the theory but doesn't prove it. So the basic entanglement model, then, is that in the bird's eye, you have this enzyme cryptochrome, which generates free radicals, which then become sensitive to the Earth's magnetic field. And how they interact then is uh, will generate products, and those products will make a difference to how the bird sees the Earth's magnetic field. So that's the theory. Um, and as I said, it's consistent with, um, uh, with the data. Okay, now lastly, I'll quickly go through one other idea, and this is the one that uh, Jim, uh, Jim Al-Khalili and I are looking at, whether proton tunneling can be involved in enzyme reactions. So as I've pointed out, the coding protons of DNA bases are quantum mechanical entities. This guy, uh, Swedish, um, Swedish or Norwegian, I can't remember now, um, physicist proposed that protons can tunnel into the wrong position to cause mutations by a, um, okay, we'll skip that. Okay, uh, so they tunnel, so this is the normal Watson and Crick base pairing. Those protons can, so loading proposed, tunnel. And you get a double proton transfer which keeps the charge the same, because otherwise it wouldn't happen. So you get two protons, one going one way, one going the other way, and then in the wrong configuration, what's called the tautomeric configuration, if this proton tunneling reaction has happened, this is a normal base in which thymine will pair with adenine. If this tunnel reaction will take place, then adenine will pair with cytosine rather than thymine. And that will cause a mutation. So if this tunneling reaction is taking place, it could be a cause of mutations. Mutations are, of course, the driver of evolution, the cause of cancer, so they're very important. Is this really a cause of mutation? We still don't know, but these are the kind of experiments that we've been looking at, looking at whether mutation frequency is affected with replacing hydrogen for deuterium in E. coli. This is uh, E. coli cells and the blue spots indicate mutants. We can count the mutants when we do this experiment of looking at mutation frequency in ordinary water. We do another count when we do the experiment in deuterated water, heavy water, and we get differences. Doesn't prove that it's down to proton tunneling, but at least it's consistent with it. So there's the mutation rate in ordinary water, 50% uh, D2O, 100% D2O. So it's consistent. And we are 
doing experiments, further experiments, to try to narrow that down and constrain this a little bit more. Because lots of other things could be sensitive to deuterium in this experiment. So those are the candidates for quantum biology that I'll be discussed. Uh, that I've discussed. That's all I'll be discussing in uh, in this lecture. Photosystems, enzymes, magnetoreception, and DNA mutations. There are others. There's evidence that our sense of smell may be quantum mechanical. Um, quantum mechanics could be involved in the origin of life or even consciousness. Some people claim. More details in the book by me and Jim Al Khalili. Lastly, I wanted to mention that we've recently set up at the University of Surrey a quantum biology doctoral training center, which is going to have 21 PhD students running through it over the next few years. Our first intake uh, was in October. Um, of uh, students here, that, here are our students at our celebratory launch event. Uh, these are the kind of projects that they're working on. We've got another bunch of students arriving who will be arriving in the autumn of this year. So what I wanted to point out is that we are keen to collaborate with other laboratories who are interested in quantum biology and maybe have shared studentships or uh, collaborative projects for anyone who might want to do, um, uh, um, might take a, a, a walk into this interesting and exciting, I think, new field. And there's more details on our website as is shown there. And I think that's all I was going to say. Thank you very much. So in your entanglement model, it's not mine, it's the uh, Wix's model, yeah. Pardon? It's not my model, it's the uh, sort of Wix's model, but uh, Well, it's a community yeah. model. Yeah. Community model. Community model. So in the entanglement model, what is the role of light in the entanglement of the Pardon? To make the free radical. So that's essential. So if you didn't have light, you wouldn't have to make the free radical. Yes. Yeah. And, and when you're looking at catalysis, mm -hmm. uh, you're looking at very complicated uh, catalytic reactions in biology. But has anybody ever taken the quantum mechanics uh, tools that you have understanding now in the entanglements and applied it to something like a platinum crystal? Which is a highly used catalyst in practice. It's not in, it may not be in biology, but it's in practice. Well, no, it's no, a good question whether. But it's a cleaner system for you to sort yeah, out the entanglement. It could be. And I mean, yes, it could be that catalysts, inorganic catalysts, may also use quantum mechanical um, properties. I don't know if there's any evidence that they do. Um, but yeah, it's a good point that we probably need to investigate that as well. That's so now people are studying uh, exoplanets. So what is the probability of the life appearance at the... A very interesting question. Um, whether, um, yeah, um, whether, uh, whether uh, the probability of life appearing on other planets, uh, with the, I suppose, the relevance to this talk is, if life is quantum mechanical, does it make it any more or less likely that it is? I would say if, Life seems to, if, if quantum biology is right, and it's still very controversial, then it suggests that quantum mechanics is, has been involved in life since its inception. I mean, as I was arguing, DNA is essentially a quantum mechanical information storage system. It's storing information in the position of protons. So quantum mechanics has been there since its inception. And it will kind of, suggest, and then quantum mechanics turning up in enzyme reactions, navigation, photosystems. It would suggest that quantum mechanics has always been around. And it's not surprising, as a, uh, life has been moving particles in systems for three and a half billion years. It's been bumping into quantum mechanics all the time when it's doing that. So life has evolved to presumably make good use of what it can from the quantum mechanical level. I think it there, thereby makes life more probable because it makes quantum mechanics, if qu because quantum mechanics is fundamental to matter, and if quantum mechanics makes life more probable by being involved in so many different biological systems, then I think it makes it likely that life is more likely to be around in other planets. Because it's it's almost it's almost suggesting that the equations of quantum mechanics 
I'm making, are predicting that life will emerge. It's almost suggesting that, but that is a jump further than what's there at the moment. But, you know, you never know. You never know. There's always the anthropic principle, which say, you know, saying that uh, um, maybe the... Uh, I like the anthropic... Everyone knows the anthropic principle. Like, okay. They are, I kind of like it as a biologist, because it says that if you want to know the value of the fundamental constants, ask a biologist, because actually they're determined by biology, since the anthropic principle says that you've got to develop life. So everything in physics then has to narrow down and has to be constrained to make life because we're here. So it kind of throws, um, throws it back at biology. And I think if quantum mechanics is involved in biology, then it could be that quantum mechanics, it has been proposed that the laws of physics may even change. Maybe quantum mechanics has been, uh, is designed for life. It's obviously far, far uh, beyond the evidence, but <laughs> it's speculative, usually speculative. What's the role of temperature in biological mutations? How do you cool it, cool it down? Uh, well, you do say molecular motion. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You, you can't do the same as in physics, of course. If you, you can't do anything below 0 degrees C, hmm. life stops. So uh, you've only got a window of 113 degrees that you can play with. The hottest, the um, microbes that can grow at the highest temperatures, I think, 113 degrees. Nothing can replicate in ice, so you've got between uh, only 130 degrees to work with. But within that, mutations are more frequent, uh, are caused by temperature. Heat will cause breaks in DNA structures, so mutations are sensitive to temperature. But to do the kind of thing that you're looking at in terms of looking at whether mutation will have that sensitivity to temperature that you can demonstrate for enzyme reactions, you can't do it. The quantum mechanics is a change. Now, quantum mechanics won't change, but you can't do the experiments below yeah. zero degrees C, so you can't look at replication and mutation rate for lower temperatures, unfortunately. Uh, for me, quantum mechanics is fundamentally asymmetric in time, in the sense one says very often one mm. cannot measure better than H bar uh, something. Yeah, yeah. Which, to my opinion, is wrong, because you can measure properties of something better than H bar, but okay. this concerns the past. Yeah. But you cannot prepare a particle with bet properties better than H bar. So you cannot prepare the future mm -hmm. better than H bar. You can measure the past better okay. than H bar. So the sense, future is always uncertain in quantum mechanics. Yes, whereas the past is, isn't. Is, could yeah. this have some influence on the evolution of systems that it's asymmetric that it's yeah, that's a very interesting question um, I don't know to tell you the truth it's a, a intriguing question whether the asymmetry and I've always been you know the asymmetry of time is still always a um, controversial I think in, in, in quantum mechanics I mean in the multiverse theory there isn't an asymmetry in time isn't that right so it's, uh, it's only if you have that the measurement um, which you know, biologists will go with always a measurement. I, I don't, I don't know any biologist who likes, who likes the multiverse theory. So yes, that whether that measurement generates an asymmetry that causes, you know, we're very interested in biology at the moment, and just talking to some of the biologists here in stochasticity. It seems to be in biology stochasticity, the randomness is positively utilised by biological systems to generate variation. If that stochasticity may be quantum mechanical, then I think it's interesting, but I'm not quite sure why. If it's rather than classical noise, if it's quantum noise at the bottom of some st stochasticity, would it have other properties? I think it would. And I have toyed with this idea that it would, because how would you how would you tell the difference between if you go stochasticity that's classical and stochasticity that's quantum mechanical? Measurement should affect quantum mechanical stochasticity but it won't affect classical. And whether there are systems that will demonstrate in them, that in biology, it's a hard question, but it's an interesting one. Yeah, I, I enjoyed your thought very much. I found it thought-provoking. Thank, thank you. Very much for, for, for presenting that. You, you made this point about the uh, great sensitivity of uh, biology to, to quantum underlying. Yeah. I certainly you know, admire your enthusiasm for biology, but what, what I offer for food for thought 
Mm -hmm. If I take uh, deuterium and hydrogen and compress it rapidly, not much happens. But if I take deuterium and tritium and I compress it rapidly, I have a, a fusion effect, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. This yeah. is a quantum sensitivity of right. a non biological yeah. system yeah. that depends not, not on a molecule, but just on the change of a single neutron. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It really shows the exquisite sense. Yes, I suppose um, nothing in biology. If if biology had any property that was exclusive, then you're talking almost vitalism. So there's nothing in biology that won't be found somewhere. But I don't think generally you get that sensitivity to. I mean, a you know, Geiger counter will be sensitive to uh, um, um, atomic level events. So you can engineer it, and it can happen in certain systems. But life depends on it, I would say. So I think there's a big difference. But life also depends on the star of burning. And yeah, 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 it's true, true. Yes, yeah, 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 true, true, true. But I think it still is unusual. Well, I say, it's not unusual, but it's most inanimate stuff isn't that sensitive. But yeah, you're right. There are some, uh, it is some as you would expect, there is. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, you know, what's... What's something about the biological system that sort of you know, keep these quantum by entanglement, you know, tunneling yeah. in time, uh, you know, compared to like yeah, yeah. the laboratory? And there is. Uh, that's the most exciting area of quantum biology. When quantum biology was, if you like, revived from, uh, by people like Greg Engel, people said, no, these, this quantum coherence can't survive for this long in biological systems. And it's been shown that it can. And why it can is really, really interesting, I think. I mean, we've discussed already, when you do experiments, uh, physics experiments, to detect entanglement, coherence, etc., you have to do everything close to absolute zero on an optics table in a vacuum. And that's because vibrations knock everything out of kilter, if you like. They, they make everything go out of phase. In biology, it seems to be, that vibrations are actually necessary to maintain coherence. That the vibration, for instance, in the photosystems, that um, uh, the surrounding protein seems to, if you like, resonate with some of the key, the exciton frequency that maintains it coherent. So it seems to be that life has found a way of utilizing vibrations to maintain rather than destroy coherence. And this may be the most exciting and interesting and most far reaching consequence of quantum biology is showing a different way of maintaining quantum coherence at high temperatures for long periods of time, which of course in quantum computing would be fantastic if you could do that kind of stuff. So that I think is one of the most exciting and controversial areas. It's, sort of, it's, it's described as what the vibrations around, photo, around things like photosystems but also in enzymes have colored noise. So it's not random Gaussian noise. It's very specific frequencies, and some of those frequencies are interacting with the system and maintaining coherence. Yeah, you sort of, sort of answered my question, but I just want, want to make sure uh, I want to draw a, a, a conclusion or to see if you have a I mean, so just to, to, to set it up, you, you talked about waves on, on, on a water surface. Uh, yeah. Waves uh, are different than particle behavior, and they emanate from the molecular structure of the water. But I don't need to understand the molecular structure of water to make a very good model of a wave on a water surface. It rarely does that. Yes. that, that, that come sure. with. But I can make a very simple model. It has nothing to do with Avogadro's number. Okay. Right. And now if you were to say that quantum entanglement, which I would distinguish from, from tunneling, tunneling I don't think requires very sophisticated increase in complexity. Uh, are you saying that quantum entanglement plays a fundamental role in biology? Because I would say if it does, it makes the complexity of the system enormously bigger, uh, superhuman, with humans using any classical tools that we can only understand in biological system if we have a computer or a computational device that's based upon it. Yeah, yeah. I, it has, Is that your statement? Uh, yeah. I would, Do you agree with that statement? Yeah, yeah, I would agree with the statement as, as it's, that, that if entanglement is involved mm -hmm. in biology, it's extraordinarily important and significant, as you say, we need the computer in order to entangle it in order to understand it. The evidence for quantum uh, entanglement is increasing. The alien navigation, I wouldn't say it's proven that the quantum entanglement is, is involved in that system, but uh, it's quite strong. There is also uh, an experiment recently, again, this is probably proven, an experiment recently performed by Vladko Ventral at the University of Oxford, uh, of Oxford, 
who actually entangle a whole living bacterial cell with the photonic field and shows that it was entangled. They published this paper, I can't remember where it was, last year. Still very controversial, but Blackgo Vectral is one of the brightest uh, uh, quantum information theorists I know of. And uh, it seems to be that it's sound that in this experimental system it could entangle a whole bacterial cell with a photonic field. I still am not sure about entanglement, and entanglement is the area that is most controversial in quantum biology, whether entanglement really is involved in biology. I would say the jury is still very much out on that question. I think it is. I think it is, but I wouldn't. Um, I, I would <laughs> say it's very good to, to, to resist it. theories which are much more complicated than simpler theories until we have no choice. I, absolutely, I'm a big fan of Occam's razor. So choose the simplest theory all the all the time. And I would say at the moment there isn't strong enough evidence to favour entanglement over classical explanations. I found it suspicious, uh, suspicious that it is involved in some places. Yeah, maybe one last. Um, um. Uh, there are speculations that uh, the fact that biological molecules contain the polarization uh, of the light in one direction yeah. related to the big interaction in physics. Okay. Because big interaction has only left current. Mm. So maybe uh, some point when it was started, by some random case, mm. was selected. That has been proposed. There's a, a problem with one of the many problems with the origin of life is the chirality of all yeah, chirality. of all uh, biomolecules, and yes. I know that has been uh, proposed. So how is it that in, in organic processes will always always generate equal chiral forms, and yet life is it, all the biomolecules are strongly chiral one way or another? And how did that ever come across with an in, a chiral universe? Uh, and the weak interaction has been proposed to be involved in that. I can't remember exactly how, but it has been proposed that there was something about the early moments of life interacting with a weak force and generating some preference for chirality in biomolecules. But I, I think it's very speculative. Yes, it's very good. Yeah. I think we should thank Professor. Okay, thank you.